I, I, I certainly uh, agree that face-to-face um, -face encounter demands uh, focused attention and its own openness and its own intelligence, uh, its own spontaneity and its own discipline, both. Okay? So it isn't that it's just the intuitive, it is the intuitive and the explicit, the tacit and the elaborated that's in face-to-face -face love as in any other kind. Um, and of course, uh, you don't say, whoops, sorry, I have to think about the conquest. You know, I don't care uh, that you're licking my tonsils. Well, I have a dog. You see, speak <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Science says, I mean, this is, this is okay, where we have another, I mean, frequently empirical knowledge is disappointing. Okay. No, it's good. But once in a while it's actually rather pleasing because it's on your side. Yeah. And this is a case where science says, that little kids who grow up with dogs and cats in their house are less likely to get asthma than little kids who grow up without them. And it seems to be because if the environment is too clean, the kid's immune system doesn't develop properly. And so a nice, uh, have, you know, friendly and available dog tongue inside your child's mouth is a very good idea. But in any case, whether it's finally hygienic, you know, proper, you know, whether it's really part of proper immune system development or not, whether this, this may, all science is revisable, this may prove to be a very partial story and finally not hold up under more serious testing, so anyone's going to pay for more serious testing. But there is no NIH for dogs, so an awful lot of things you'd like to know, there, you know, you're not going to know because it costs an awful lot of money to stabilize a fact in the world. It's very expensive to stabilize facts. So um, I happen to have a dog who has a god kid, as you saw, Marco. Uh, and they uh, like to slurp each other, as children do, puppies and babies. And so she never learned proper inhibition. And so she engages in this reprehensible behavior, uh, which I have taken on as a philosophical metaphor. <laughs> Because con confrontation with the corporeal often worries philosophers. No, no. Not me. But the problem is, you know, let's uh, take a kind of sober tone in the first moment. <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you know, there is animal porno. Yes, there is. Right. So, and I, I was kind Which I think of, is abusive. I was really uh, surprised, I must say, and when I first, a few weeks ago, discovered what there is even available, totally free in the, mm -hmm. in the internet of, of Gambazet. But how to, how to bring rights? The abuse, where, where do you draw the line here? Why well, should you not say this intercourse between animals and, and uh, now, people? Now, you're a theorist of communication, Wolfgang, and you know that the word intercourse is ambiguous. No, no, I'm really meaning intercourse. Yeah, well, I wasn't. <laughs> you are not, I, I know. To take me literally is always a serious no, no. problem. But, but, I, but I want to know if you are, have a, this loving relationship, ah, why, yes. why draw a line? Even if you're Catholic, maybe you can draw the line. Well, actually, Catholics are probably less likely to than most others. Oh, no, they say no more <laughs> production. <laughs> Only screwing if you want to be productive. Because it's not possible with a dog, so don't screw. So, so there you would have a line. It might be possible to money technology being what it is, but probably not in the near future. But anyway, but, where is the line? Is there a line necessary? Well, and how is it? Is it a line? If you have these kids, for example, is it the same uh, situation? Well, I think there's a line in the line, in the sense that lines are emergent out of any moral inquiry that one takes on uh, seriously. That lines emerge out of out of uh, inquiring into ways of life and, and questions of flourishing, and you don't have the answers in the in the abstract. On the other hand, you do reach answers that make sense. And I, it is my opinion that literal sexual relationships with um, other organisms on the whole would be abusive of other organisms for some of the same reasons that they are almost overwhelmingly likely to be abusive of young children. Mm -hmm. That there are problems of mutuality of consent uh, okay. involved that would be violated. And animals, um, the kinds of things I'm talking about, animals do what Gregory Basin would have described as you know, a kind of metal level. Animals know about play. Many, many animals, not just dogs, play. They know perfectly well the difference between what's serious and what's play. Uh, and the kinds of games that I'm talking about are, I believe, by both the human and the dog partners, understood to be within this uh, kind of a really interesting meta behavior called play. It's one of the things that convinces me about distributed um, bodily mental capacities across uh, living nature, that very many organisms seem to be capable of knowing the difference between the literal and the playful. 
Uh, that's, that's really a very interesting thing, not to be just ours. Uh, and I think that what would cross the line would be um, where the rules can't be shared uh, in that kind of uh, substantive way. Yeah. Okay, I understand. I don't want to go into this further, so yeah. uh, please, any... But I think that raises the question of authority in relationships with um, organisms that, on, uh, that are dependent on them come up in really uh, s striking ways. Mm -hmm. And there is no violence that has not been perpetuated by members of our species on dogs in particular and animals in general. Uh, it's not a very pretty story. Okay. Um, no, I don't have uh, literal biological children. Mine are all firmly haploid and now shriveled. Uh, I wanted dogs, not children. I think there are some similarities in affectional structure, in obligation, in pattern of life, uh, in, in uh, adult human beings to adult dogs, um, or adult. I'm, I'm, won't try to generalize to other organisms. I think there are some similarities, but I think there are terribly important differences. And I think that to relate to adult dogs as furry children is a form of dog abuse that sets the dog up for behavior that will get the dog killed and likely get somebody bitten, that will mistake authority relationships to the detriment of both the humans and the animals. Uh, and I have very, very strong resistances to the infantilization of adult members of other species. I think it's appropriate to treat them as infants when they're puppies, you know, but to treat them as canine infants, not as human infants, uh, which means all kinds of things. It includes an, ob uh, an obligation toward knowledge, an obligation to find out what you need to know to do it right. I think any serious relation carries with it an epistemological obligation to find out what you need to know to do it halfway right. I think that a parent with a child engaged in school sports would be... Um, that a larger civic discourse around pedagogy, around sport, around uh, competition, around skill, uh, uh, so forth, so forth uh, that these things, the discussions could be enhanced by uh, parents and, and uh, tr uh, coaches and so forth who knew more about the history of sport, who knew, knew something about its relationship to race, class, and gender, and sexuality, and, and competence, and confidence, and so forth, and that the history of sport is a very important subject that is treated um, and a very important question in the history of democracies and all the rest of it that is treated uh, all too lightly. And uh, in, again, any relationship that matters, and one would be hard pressed to say that sports don't matter in the cultures that all of us in this room have inhabited, both by force and by choice. Sports saturate our cultures for better and for worse, and then not to take them on in their uh, depth and complexity is a bad mistake as a citizen. Do you see the... Um 